Okay, I'm Judd Roberts in Roswell, and I was the a minority stockholder and the manager of a radio station here back in those days. Radio station KGFL. Okay. And uh, we we had we got word of it with the rancher himself. Word of the crash. Oh, oh I beg your pardon. Of this UFO. Uh huh. Of course, there was a release that came out of Walt Hotz. PIO department out at Walker Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and uh, so we followed it up. I did not go out because I, I to the craft site. I did not go out to the craft site. Excuse me for being so hesitant about this. <laughs> if I'd look at the camera instead of you, it perhaps would be easier. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's why I'm sitting over here so you can talk to me. Okay, so that's it. Uh, be that as it may, uh, we. So you were aware of something going on oh, out oh, there. Definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and then directly from Walter's press release or other sources? Other sources. As a matter of fact, um, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but it was true. We hid out the rancher for one night. We were aware of that. Yeah. Where? Yes, and we, we, did a, we did some transcriptions with him and so mm -hmm. forth. Good old wire recorders, if you will. Where did you hide him out? We had him out in Mr. Whitmore's house here in town. He lived out outside of the city limits on the east side. So you were present at the actual interview? I was not. You were not. I was trying to run the station at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. The question that we, that we ran into is the very next morning, some friendly person, probably from Clinton Anderson's office, called us from Washington and said, you are, we, we understand that you have some information, and we want to assure you that if you release it on this matter, because it's not supposed to be released, it's very possible that your license could be in jeopardy, and so we suggest that you not do it. And he said, when I mean in jeopardy, like maybe three days. Did, was there any suggestion when you got that phone call? I mean, did Walt Whitmore hesitate about releasing the information? Did he say, well, we're not going to release it, or we no, might I, release I it? I made that decision. So you, you got the call? Yes, I was at the office, you see. C.W. Whitmore, with whom I mm -hmm. worked, uh, had different office hours than you and I. Mm -hmm. And he was a great nighttime worker, and he came in about 6 o'clock at night to talk to me about the radio business, about the time since I'd been there since <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so you got the phone call from Washington? Yes. yes and they, they told you that your license was in jeopardy? Did you? They, did they indicated mm -hmm. that that would be a, a, a very negative thing. What convinced you that they meant business and you were really talking to somebody important? I don't even remember who it was who identified himself. Was there any? But he convinced but, you. But he convinced me because they'd already made such a stir about about the releases, you see, to the newspaper and so forth. And so, they, in other words, the clamps went on the story. But this was not unusual for me because I had been down here for a couple of years at that time from mm -hmm. Minneapolis, and with things like air crashes at Walker Air Force Base or the problems of that sort, it was not unusual for us to talk to the people and they'd say, okay, we've got a release date on this and not before and not before this time. Of course, we always fought it because they always tried to take care of the afternoon newspaper. Well, that, that, was, that was where my question was going. When you got the phone call from Washington, was there any thought about going ahead to release the story anyway or did you just immediately kill it? No, we did not. We didn't think so. We, we didn't know of it. So when you got the phone call, that was it. The story was done. That was as far as I was concerned. Okay. I saw no reason to do it because they'd already had the disclaimers out there, mm -hmm. 10 tons of them talking about <laughs> these weather balloons and so forth. And uh, so that was it. The point is that I was unable, I never did see the material. Mm -hmm. I talked to people just as you had. Mm -hmm. Who did you talk to? I, I can't remember. Can't remember at all. Now you say you hit out or Walt Whitmore hit out Brazel overnight on. Oh yes, but it was W. E. Whitmore. Yes, we understand. Senior, senior. Yeah, senior. Um, so he had the the forty five minute wire recording of Brazel's interview that. I don't know how long it was. In those days, with wire recorders, all he, these are guys all before your time. And if you recorded fifteen minutes, you took it back to the studio, and it took you fifteen minutes to rewind it. Mm -hmm. At three point seven five or whatever. Do you remember whatever happened to that uh, wire recording? Was it erased? I, no, I haven't. At that particular time, 
uh, there was there was quite a clamp on on discussion of this, mm -hmm. and because there were people who uh, were well thought of people who were pretty well convinced, and Marcel was one of them, and I knew all of those people out of Walker because we had remotes out there, and we did lots of broadcasts out of there. So uh, the I don't think that the, the I think that we just decided that for Walt Hot's sake and so forth, that we would sit tight and accept whatever it was, even though in our innermost mind we had real sudden, a real question about the validity of it. Mm -hmm. Had they ever treated a, a story like this before? Had they ever created one? Had they ever treated a story in this way? Oh, not in this particular way, because this was a highly unique experience. However, as I say, we were used to it because if there were crashes, you didn't say anything about it until the people had been there and all of that sort of thing. Well, yeah, they, they embargoed. Yes, news, precisely. But this was a total clamp down. Well, I would say so. It certainly was as far as we were yeah. concerned. And there, were, there was no time limit on this. They didn't say there after such and such day like you can... I can't tell you Any because... You see, I just got down here in 46 when I came down here from Pillsbury in Minneapolis. And uh, so I hadn't run into that sort of thing. There was lots of it when we were in the missile site business down there and so forth. Because if there was a problem, we were advised and we were out there with our blinking lights and all that sort of stuff. But we, we held, we sat on those things until there were decent releases on People have asked me because there's been a discussion, particularly after after your broadcast, mm -hmm. and that that revitalized. In fact, I was up in Craig, Colorado, last week, and a guy who hasn't been interested at all, all of a sudden he's a fan, and I sent him the book from Moore, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, when I got home here on the weekend, but but the point is that in so far as I was concerned, people say, "Do you think it was true?" And I said, "I don't, I don't know." But I'll tell you this, I, I, it's hard for me to believe that in this infinitesimally small area of the universe that we're, we're the only people with any intelligence. So if there are, and another thing that, that interested me is because I had a friend who had a lot of hours, with, I think it was with Northwest at that time, and he had I don't know how many hours of, in, as captain, and when he said he saw something off the left wing. Here's a guy who, when he makes a statement, if you're a disbeliever or an unbeliever, you say, boy, I don't want to fly with him because I think he's a nut. So he puts his own business in jeopardy, as it were. So W. Whitmore had Brazel overnight. Yeah. Did you did actually see Brazel himself? Did you ever only, see Brazel? Only when they first came in, yeah. How did he come across to you? I didn't talk to him very much. Mm -hmm. We were, frankly, we were hiding the thing for Halloween, and we didn't want to make much of a stir on it. And Whitmore lived way out on East Sector. So that's that's about it. Did um, uh, so? Brazel is with Walt Whitmore overnight. Yeah. Did the military come and pick him up, or did Whitmore take him to? I think he turned him over. Would it be fair to say that Whitmore surrendered him to the military, or is oh, I that too think strong? So because I, he was just a guest overnight. Okay. So, so you don't surrender a guest unless your name is this guy over in Iraq. But was the military, <laughs> but the military was looking for him, though. I think so. Yeah. Was was W. Whitmore hiding Brazel from the military or from your rivals? He was. He. We just had a good story. So. Whitmore was more worried about protecting his story than the military finding where Brazel sure, was. Sure. We had no reason to hide him out, particularly, except we wanted to do some talking to him first. It so happened that it was all for nothing because we didn't use him. Did, okay, so uh, that, that next morning, Whitmore decided he wanted to go out to the crash site. No, I decided that. You decided. I wanted to go out because, because, because they, Whitmore had been out there. They, been out to the crash site or? Yeah, I think, but I don't know, he couldn't get any closer than I did. I thought we could do it with a back road or something. So you followed the back roads out toward sure. Corona. Sure. What happened when you got out toward the well, crest? Well, they just had some roadblocks, that was all. And what I was on one of the back roads. 
Well, if they had the whole thing, you used the word cordon a minute ago. I presume that might be a pretty one. I didn't pay that much attention to. I wasn't driving. We had another guy, and, and I was more interested in just getting out there and disappointed because, believe me, we didn't get close. You say another guy, do you have to remember who that was? I have the slightest idea. We had about six people working for the station. So you went out to the, to the area, you were stopped by the... Sure. What did, how, did, sure. how did they do that? They just say, sorry, the road's closed, this is a restricted area. Military men? Yeah, we were used to that. Um, how, what, were, they, were they in a jeep, were they in a car? I can't imagine. I imagine they were just one of their blue sedans that they had. And uh, as you approached, the fellow came out on the road and waved you down? Yeah, sure. But, but as a matter of fact, the reason I'm so vague, I don't mean to be intentional, is because of that thing, it wasn't really a big deal. Because we'd had these experiences before where some accident had happened and where they, they just kind of blocked off the whole area. So it, it was perfectly reasonable as far as I was concerned. So you didn't get out to the site, you were t turned around no. at that point and came back to Roswell. How, how close did you get, roughly? I'd, I'll bet I wasn't within 15 miles. I don't know. I haven't any idea because at that time, as I say, it wasn't important. We wanted, we wanted to see the stuff we heard about. And of course, by that time, it was all picked up, certainly that day. That's about the story. You said the stuff you heard about. What did you hear? What do you recall? Well, uh, one of the things that I still remember specifically is that the material, they said, was as thin as a wrapper on a Lucky Strike package, but you couldn't break it, and if you twisted it and scrunched it up together, it would, it would come back to its own deal. They tried to burn it, and so forth, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it, was, it was a good mystery for a small town. But of course, we had a large, at that particular time, we had a lot of military people here, as you know. Do you notice any extraordinary military activity in town at that time? Of course, everybody started watching this guy. So there was an attitude within the town itself. Oh, very aware. And, and my, my thought was, that looking back to the old days of the invasion, if you remember. War of the World. Yeah. And, and the effect it had on people on the East Coast, particularly. And I thought that perhaps maybe this was a good reason. I have reason now to believe that it was more than just protecting the public from uh, getting upset over something. Because after that, you know, we got into little Lubbock lights and all of these sort of things. And, and people that I knew who were highly respectable, people, longtime guys, ranchers, and people like that, who saw some of these things, and they had no reason to they had no reason to, to kid anybody about standing on the side of their pickup and watching these lights go back and forth up in the mountains. They're not the, they're, they're not the sort of people who, who needed to do that, or was it their nature to be that sort of person? Around the station, what was the general reaction to the weather balloon story? <laughs> Hell, the weather balloons were being launched about a block from us every night. From the, because they did that with the, uh, they did that with the, uh, the uh, weather bureau at that time. That's how they got their readings. So weather balloons per se were not that, were not that interesting to us. So you didn't buy that explanation. We yet? really didn't, but we didn't have any good reason because that, that material was scattered up there, as you well know, and uh, it wasn't like being able to see a where something goes down and there's a hell of an explosion and there's a big dark, dark place. Did you ever have occasion to talk to, say, Colonel Blanchard or any of the people out at the base after this event and subsequent years and learn anything from them? Maybe they said something to you off? I don't think so. Bill Blanchard was, was, was one of the first guys I knew out there because he had served on, under my uncle, who was a general in the Air Force. In fact, we, we had four guys out there who were commanders who had all been students under him down at what used to be Kelly, down in San Antonio. So I always made it a point to, to meet those people because they're nice people. And we entertained them a few times, and they uh, we could go in there for a drink or something on occasion. But no, no, we didn't discuss it. 
And I don't know why we didn't, because it, that would have been the time to, to try to find out something, as it were. Mm -hmm. but, uh, After Whitmore turned Brazel over to yeah. the military, yeah. you saw him as it did he ever Did I see Rod? You saw Whitmore, certainly. Oh, sure. The first chance you had to ask him about wire recording. I do not know in retrospect why I didn't. I just figured it was a dead story. And what you're saying is that Whitmore never told you what the rancher said? Oh, he did just just plain discussion, but, mm -hmm. but the rancher didn't say much. The rancher merely said, Hey, I was out and I was riding and I saw this and this is what it looked like and I couldn't figure out what it was. And so I came to town to tell some people and mentioned it to some people and pretty soon there was great interest. And so I don't think that, that he himself went in there and did a lot of pseudo-scientific experiments with this material. There were all sorts of stories about bodies being loaded into planes and all that sort of stuff. And part of the first, that first bunch went right down to uh, Fort Worth to Carswell. And the rest of them, I understood, went back to uh, who was at Akron? You mean Dayton? Right Dayton? Field? Right field. Yeah, Dayton. Yeah. Did you say others? You mean other aircraft? Or? Yeah, the presumption was. Did you hear any bizarre stories of aliens running loose in Roswell at the time or no. anything like that? No, we did not. We probably would. We've probably been too scared to notice it. <laughs> After all, that was all pre-ET, and we didn't know how friendly mm -hmm. these folk are. <laughs> So basically, all you really know is a little bit of what Whitmore told you about the rancher finding the debris sure. coming into town sure. and then attempting yourself to go out to the site and being turned back yeah. and receiving the phone call. Now, are you sure it was Clinton Anderson's office? And not oh, no, but I would assume so. He's our senator. Uh, could it have been Dennis Chavez? Oh, well, it could have been Dennis Chavez, I presume. So from that, from, from that was good enough for us because at that particular time, you didn't go around wrestling with the FCC if you could help it. They gave you enough trouble on, on other things, sitting out on a hill and monitoring you with a lousy 250 watts at that time. Yeah. <laughs> to make sure you weren't putting out bad information. Oh, <laughs> bad information and or, or ASCAP was out there trying to find if we were playing some of their stuff and not reporting it. So <laughs> we had all of the government that we needed. Any information about the rancher in the next couple of days? No. No, I don't. The, uh, did you have the impression where he was? If I do not recall. It, it's very possible. And, and, uh, and all I know, he didn't come back into the station or anything like that. Did you ever see Brazel after that? I never did. But that's not unusual. These guys all live hell and gone away, as you know. And, uh, and uh, we were busy at that time. And I had a small small staff and, and three or four guys working from the base who were working part-time and so forth. And it was, it, uh, as I say, in retrospect, if we'd, if we'd had any idea of what we had and what general interest there would be, <laughs> boy, then, then it would have been easy and, and we would have, obviously, we would have sat down and said, let's see if we can find out this and that and put two and two together and get something. Did the military ever come by the station to pick up press releases or anything like that? No. No indication that the military came back to um, make sure there was nothing left behind that might? No, no, I don't think so. Because we were, we were, we were very close to the PIO department out mm -hmm. there. And uh, they were a source of news. And uh, even if they had, why, I don't think it would have made a, a great mental note after all of these years because it was was not that uncommon a situation, like you said. Mm -hmm. Through the years, and certainly since the resurrection of all these stories, the stories involved, any people that you've talked to, any former colleagues or anyone else that ever voiced an opinion, Related any little tidbits of information to you? Oh, that I didn't have? 
Mm -hmm. No, because it was usually, do you believe this stuff? And it so happened that, 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 that I believed it to some extent at that time, and then ultimately I just felt more and more that, that this was a possibility. Uh, it, 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 was, it was nicely hushed up, let me put it that way. That's a general way of putting it. So you, you weren't that concerned that the military came in and suggested that uh, you not release the story. That oh. sort of thing happened on a regular basis. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Whether it was an aircraft accident or maybe something that... Well, see, we were trying to cover all of that stuff at the local level because that's what we had. That's all we had. And uh, so uh, in the, the two stations with which I was associated over a period of time, we always had mobile units and we always had we could broadcast and so forth. And even in those days, if there was a story why we chased it pretty hard. But for, for this one, you didn't really think there was a story. Because I didn't think it was, we were going to be able to do anything with it. I thought that, that whatever they were going to, whatever they were going to report, because there were, the question was in many minds here, that whatever they were going to report, that's what, that's what we would tell them. So the people would know. So there was no place for you to go with the story? No. No, because we really didn't have the story. We had, we had a discussion with a guy who had found some stuff, but they, 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 they did a good job of, of, of closing that thing up. Hell, I think Marcel was out of here in, I don't know, four or five days, I imagine. There, was, there, were, there were some people that were shipped out. Maybe, they were, maybe that had been planned for 90 days, but the coincidence of it made people say, boy, we'll get him out of here. Was there much talk among the, the townspeople? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, my, yeah. Sure. The most exciting thing that happened since they sold the prize bull at the 4-H sale. <laughs> <laughs> Covering all the big news. Yes, I mean, secondary, secondary story, but next is the bull. Mm -hmm. Was there any general tone to the public reaction? That they believed it, they didn't believe it, whatever. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have any idea because we never did run a poll or anything like that. I would suggest that that there were some people who said, Boy, this must be a big story or they wouldn't have made such an effort. And others who said, Some nut. And so a weather balloon. It was a weather balloon, and that's good enough for me if they told me it was a weather balloon by George. Which side were you on? I was in the middle between at that time. I have, I'm obviously have gone to the pro. There was such a thing now, but only on the basis of of, of small small bore logic. That, as to repeat myself, if if if, if we think with this little dot, then it, it's getting smaller and smaller all the time. Even though this thing isn't working too well up there now, but the the fact is that that for us to consider the fact that we are the only people with the intelligence to do that, and there's been so much stuff to the contrary since those days that uh, I, I don't know. All I know is I think that, that to keep repeating myself, which I don't mean to do, but you can cut it, I presume. <laughs> but, but the point is that why should we think in this, in this little weensy part of the universe that we are the only people who were ever created with any intelligence. I know people who think there, there are other intelligences in space that are perhaps way ahead of us. And this might have been, maybe somebody came down and said, hey, we saw some flares down on that little old place over here on the, on the atomic test. We saw some flares. We thought we'd send somebody down and take a look, see what was going on. And so they did, and they may have the misfortune to do some bad navigating or something. <laughs> well, that's a new way of putting it. How did you know which ranch to go to? Because we had talked to the guy when he came to town. And he actually told you, he gave you directions or told you? Uh, oh, uh, all of these old timers knew where exactly where the ranch was. 
Mm -hmm. Everybody knew where all of them were ranching. Big ranches at that time. And, uh, no, it, it, uh, I, was, I was busy in the station. And that was a very busy seven day a week job because of, we, we covered sports and we covered this and we covered that and I did all the selling of all the advertising, but little there was. So it, it uh, my job was was to stay right there and run the thing. Whitmore himself was an absentee owner, and uh, that's the most of it. Looks like that's it then. Is this deposition over then? I believe so. <laughs> I think you've done a heck of a job. Well, uh, no. But I'll turn this off for you. How's that? Fine. Were, were they in your program? But where the discussion they they thought it and they they did they never bought the idea that it was a reflection from somebody's glasses down on the ground. I'm just putting the date on this now so that we've got a picture of you with the date. So, so that we well, I, I wish I could be more helpful because I'd love to see you guys come up with some some real solutions if you could find it. We're getting there. Yeah. Are you right. right. putting the little bitty pieces together? In fact, we yeah. really can put the whole timeline together. And which is why your story is important because you have a couple of little pieces that help fit it into the whole chronology. So I can never convince you how important your story is to us. Well, I, I realize because uh, because I'm 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 impressed that that you are willing to take the pieces, but that that thing is pretty well shattered out. You've got to pick them up, don't you? It's shattered and it's old. And find them. Yeah. Oh yes, you that's the big problem. Hallucination. <laughs> I know what I thought. Well, we're we're rolling now. We've got the tape going. So you're Mrs. Lyman Strickland, Marion Strickland. Yes. And we're here in Roswell, New Mexico. On Again. September 27th. Which it says right there on the uh, official thing. And we'll turn that off. And so, let's go. <laughs> you were saying you knew Mac Brazel. Yes. He was a neighbor. And uh, you lived out near his ranch in the summer of 19. The ranches joined on the corner. They cornered. Okay. In which direction? It was southeast of Corona, mm -hmm. and uh, the cornering was um, in the same direction, southeast okay. of Corona. So you were farther from Corona than Mac was. No, he was further. Oh. That ranch belonged to the Fosters. Right. Right. And you knew Mac how long before the summer 47? We moved there in 1939. And I had three small children. Excuse me. Oh, uh, can we help you out with anything there? Or? I'll turn that off. Yes, back on. No, that's okay. We were talking about Mac Brazel. Well, we moved there in 39, and I had, my youngest child was only three or four months old. And I didn't get around to meet neighbors, but my husband did. And he undoubtedly knew Mac from very soon after we went there. We bought the place in 39. So, uh, Mac came by. He would stop and Sometimes at the barn, sometimes he came in the house. I just knew who he was. Mm -hmm. He's a very friendly guy? Yes, he was a, a very uh, self-sufficient country man. Uh, he was uh, very dependable and uh, self-confident. He was not stupid. He was not a highly educated person. Moving ahead to the summer of 1947, <laughs> leaping right ahead, um, you're, of course, aware of the events that took place in July of 47. Yes. Now, you have no personal knowledge of what happened. You didn't see anything. Uh, you didn't go out to the crash site or anything like that? No. You didn't no, I think Mac went to uh, see we were on a spur that was off of the main line that went from the Foster Ranch to uh, Corona. And uh, he 
would have gone by the Proctors and Saltermeyers first, just on mm -hmm. the way to town. Mm -hmm. But he would come out of his way to come by our place. But he came by and told us about it and probably tried to get Lyman to go down and look at it. Uh, Sally said he, she... Now Sally is your daughter? Yes. Okay. We have two sons, but they're both deceased. Mm -hmm. And uh, she thought that uh, she could remember him wanting Lyman and the boys to come down and, and the kids. Mm -hmm. She was one of the boys. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and uh, she uh, said that uh, that was a busy time of the year. Mm -hmm. If it was dry, and it was dry more than it was anything else, uh, they were feeding or marking lambs or one thing or another. Now you said you'd heard, you remember the thunderstorm or? Oh yes, because we had a, this is the house that was built later. We had a little old dinky shack that had a, a porch that wasn't any wider than that. And uh, uh, my husband, they're all ranchers go out on the porch to see where it's raining. Mm -hmm. How much and who got some? <laughs> <laughs> and he had to stand out there and see where it was raining, and there was so much thunder and lightning that uh, uh, I begged him to come in the house. And finally, there was this terrible thunderclap, and he came in and he says, "Boy, that hit something. You know, it has a different sound. Mm -hmm. It has a hollow sound." So he thought lightning had struck something. Yes, and uh, it was. Two or three days after that, that my, no, it was longer than that. It was a week or two. Did, um, he didn't see the lightning hit anything, or just? No, that's hilly country. Mm -hmm. And the clouds were hanging low. They were, they were pretty low. So, then you and Lyman, nobody went over with Mac to see the stuff? No. Uh, Mac went to the Proctors and maybe the Saltermeyers. I don't oh. know if he went there. But uh, uh, they didn't go down there with him. I guess everybody was busy. And Mac thought it was a, a weather balloon or some sort of an experiment that he was uh, glad to do the government a favor to bring them the pieces. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the attitude he had when he gathered it up and took it to town. So he went, he brought it into Roswell, mm -hmm. when you say town Roswell. Yes. Okay. And what happened to him in Roswell? Did he ever talk to you about that? Very secretly. And he didn't talk to me a lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were around my table. Um, Mac and I don't know whether Bill Brazel was there or not. I don't remember that. But uh, Mac and my kids and Lyman. And I was busy carrying the coffee pot. <laughs> and I really uh, heard more sketches of the conversation than if I were just sitting there talking like we are here. Mm -hmm. what, 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 was, what pieces of the conversation did you hear? What do you remember about that? How nasty the uh, officers at uh, the air base were to him. By nasty, what, what did he elaborate on that? He did to them, yes. He, uh, he, he was held for, I believe it was three days or three nights. Of course, ranchers all had livestock in their corrals that had to be fed, and Mac was there by himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he called Bill, Bill was in Albuquerque, mm -hmm. come down and take care of his livestock, but they literally threw him in in jail. And it was two or three days later, Lyman and Floyd Proctor had some business with the uh, Bureau of Land Management, which um, had an office. I don't remember where their office was then. Anyway, they came down here to the Bureau of Land Management together. And uh, they saw Mac being escorted by two I believe two army men, and I don't know whether he had handcuffs on or not. 
I don't believe I ever heard that. I don't believe he did. I believe they just said something about it. Because we were all, the whole neighborhood was scandalized that the army, that the services would treat people like that. People who had good intentions. Did Mac never mention what went on when he was held on the base? I didn't hear it. Uh, Shirley Walter Hawk did. He was a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't tell you because, like I said, I was carrying the coffee pot. Mm -hmm. Mac was very secretive, and I know that he made it plain that um, he was not supposed to tell this and not supposed to tell that. And I think most of what he was not supposed to tell was that there was any excitement about this material. Mm -hmm. Now that's my recollection. But Mac was pretty unhappy? Oh, you bet. He was a man who uh, had integrity. Um, he was, he definitely felt insulted and, and misused and disrespected. So he was annoyed at the way the military treated him. He was him. worse than annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> he made the effort to come in with the material and they treated him that way. Mm -hmm. That's right. And he sat at basically at your coffee table and elaborated at on it. At my dinner table. Dinner table. He didn't have a coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, meant, I meant dinner. Yeah. I meant actually kitchen table is what I meant. Yeah, that's probably uh, Was this the only time that he talked about it? Uh, did, he, did he ever mention it? Uh, maybe some other times? or? I don't remember him being at my table. I was in the house. Now, lots of women are, lots of ranch women are around the corrals a lot, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he came to the house off and on. When we built this new house, he came and helped line with the plumbing. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was later. But, um, I don't remember that he ever came during that time of stress. And he was he was definitely under some stress and felt like he had been misused and kicked around. And this was right after he got back? Yes. Right after they let him go? Not too long. And, and uh, since none of us really knew then what the importance of it was, I don't remember just how long it was. It might have been two weeks. I don't think it was two months. Did he talk about the material? Uh, yes, he did. I remember he said something about um, that you could crumple it up and it would come right back out. Now, my daughter, I have been asked before if there, anybody had any scraps of it. And my daughter told me on long distance, she was only 10 years old, and she said she wasn't impressed with it, but that Bill Bristle brought a scrap of it up there, and he was at the corral. He was not in the house, and I know I never saw any of it. I never saw it at all. And she said that it was very, very thin, that I had done, I sewed a lot, and she was familiar with fabrics, and she said it was like a very thin cotton, but very tough. Now, she emphasized the words tough. And I said, how big was this scrap bill here? And she said, oh, six inches by eight or ten. And I said, what do you reckon he did with it? And she says, well, if uh, they didn't build, I don't believe they were people who, who kept a lot of they didn't have their house cluttered like this. And she says, well, when, if uh, he didn't realize the importance of it, he probably threw it away. Now, of course, I don't know. That was just conjecture. Where, where's your daughter now? Fort Morgan, Colorado. And it's Sally? Hadalini. Would you think it'd be all right if we talked to her, called her long distance and chatted with her? I'm sure it would. <laughs> Do we have a phone number? Yes. <laughs> but uh, 
Do you have to remember what it is? Yes, I do. You want to write it down? No, I'll have it recorded. Oh. <laughs> uh, 1-303-867-5025. Okay. That's her home telephone. And that's Sally... Catalini. Catalini. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, her husband and sons wouldn't know anything about it. Are they from this area? Or are they from Colorado? Or? They're from Colorado. All of them. But she says Bill Brown bought a scrap of it by for her to take a look at. Well... Or just to show. To show. And, uh, like I said, now, she lived at the corral. Mm -hmm. uh, her daddy had to order her to the house. <laughs> <laughs> she had her horses and so forth. Uh -huh. And, uh... She was out there, and the boys were out there, and I suppose Bill stopped, and that was the whole family, as far as Bill was concerned. <laughs> so, and I don't know whether I was home or not. So basically, what you know is Mac Brazel was uh, held by the people at the base for a number of days. Yes. Uh, he came to your house and was irritated. By he their, was worse than irritated. <laughs> by, the, by the treatment of them. And, and you heard some of his discussion about what went on at the base. And then Lyman saw uh, Mac Let in me, the company of, of a number of... If I could say something that's off of the record. Back on the record. Okay. Could I ask you about the uh, thunderstorm again? The thunderstorm. Did anyone else comment? Did you hear anyone else comment about the thunderstorm. About the storm. I asked Juanita about it one time and she said no, she didn't remember it because she had little children. Her children, by 1947, mine were seven, eight, and ten years old, twelve, and uh, hers were babies. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what she said, that she didn't remember that thunderstorm. I don't know if anybody else did or not. Anyone else in the family that commented about the loud, about the loud thunder? Thunderclap? Mm -hmm. Sally could remember it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Okay. My son just said her not living. Did Mac say anything while in Roswell that he was threatened? Or that they... Uh, I think he was threatened with something because he was threatened if he opened his mouth he might get thrown in the back side of the jail and he gave that impression definitely he must not tell anything he, he said that he wasn't supposed to tell anything yes so he was angry but yet he also took it serious yes. that he couldn't say anything about it. Yes. Was that unlike him? That he would yes, it was unlike buckle him. down against something that was He a was a, a very upfront person. Uh, he would be likely to say what he thought. And if it fitted, if you didn't like it, well, so what? So what? That's what would it take to get him to keep his mouth shut about something? A serious threat. Mm -hmm. More than just a physical threat. I think so. Mm -hmm. But I don't know of any threat that was given. Right. Like I said, I was carrying the coffee pot. Mm -hmm. Could they have done anything else to try to shut him up? Like what? Bribe him. You couldn't bribe Max. I don't think he could. I think he'd double up his fist and back you away. I really do. I don't think he was that kind of person. Has anybody else made any such remarks about Mac? Well, I was just going to ask, um, as far as his financial situation prior to the incident? I don't know much about his finances. 
his wife lived in Almogorda and had a home there, and I've been there, and it was a nice house. No. Well, it was just a nice house in a nice part of town. It wasn't extraordinary in, in any which way, but it was a nice home, and she had a pretty yard with flowers. And uh, I don't know whether she didn't want to live on the ranch or what, but the Foster Ranch was a big ranch. And uh, probably the pay was something important to make. Any idea what a man would be paid to run a, I really a ranch don't. in those days? No. I know what we had to pay hired men when we hired them just by the day, but uh, I don't have any idea what a ranch manager would have done. What did a, a hand get per day back then? Uh, a common hand would get about $60 a month and, uh, uh, or uh, $5 a day for a, a day's work. If it was just, if it was hard work. And if, you knew, if it's somebody that knew what he was doing, like, windmill work or fence work. But I don't know what Mac was. It wasn't anything you talked about around the table. Was there anything different about him after this? He might have been a little more reticent because he felt like he was disgraced and he really wanted to square himself with his neighbors. I think that's why he talked a little because he was afraid that the neighbors might think he had done something of a crooked nature. But, uh, might have been a little more anxious to, I don't know. When we built this house, I said, this house that's in the painting, Lyman didn't know anything about plumbing. He cut, he cut two pieces of uh, a pipe and they were both too short. <laughs> <laughs> Mike come up and helped him and they put in, they put in the plumbing together. Now, I don't know if Mac would have done that before that or not. Mm -hmm. This was in the early 50s. Who painted the picture? One of my sons did, did it. Did he paint all these pictures? He painted everything in oil and did all of the wood carving. Anything that's in China, I did it. I'm impressed. You did this one by the fire, uh, by the, the, yes. camp, the campfire? Yes, that's a story. That's a, a story that's really true. Uh, that happened when my husband was about two or three years old. Uh, you want to turn it off? No, that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> my son painted it from his father's story about it. Uh, at that time, they had uh, no fences or very few. and. Uh, lots of cowboys and they ran this was like the Chisholm outfit but they didn't work for Chisholm they worked for Hinkley and uh, they they run cattle from the Pecos plumb to the mountains and uh, anyway these cowboys went out in the morning I don't know how many there were half a dozen and uh, this one didn't come back so they knew something had happened to him. And uh, what had happened was his horse stepped in a hole and fell with him and broke the man's leg, but not the horse's leg. And uh, the wolves could smell the blood. His, uh, the skin was broken. The boots were full of blood. And the wolves could smell the blood. And if National Geographic, and they did, I read it, they want to tell you that wolves won't attack 
Maybe they won't because they're just one. But where there's a whole ring of wolves, a, a bunch, and they smell blood, they would. And anyway, he, he had uh, little chips of wood that he got on fire and threw at them all night long. And they found him, the other cowboys found him the next morning. And uh, uh, my mother-in-law, Lyman's mother, uh, walked up to it and said, there's supposed to have been a tree right there. That's where the chips come from. <laughs> My son had never painted a tree. He never painted a tree until I insisted that he paint these that are around the house. And uh, so he didn't put any tree in it. And her sister, Aunt Jenny, walked up to it and said, somebody else in the room says, well, did he get over it? She says, well, he sure was a good old dancer. <laughs> so I guess he got over it. Those are beautiful pictures. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. I treasure everything oh, here. Oh, you should. My son was selling at the time that he died, and he had sold several portraits. And uh, the people who had commissioned portraits came and gone. But uh, I kept everything else. I could have sold some. You know, I just plastered the walls with them. Yeah. Agreed. And, and what is it that you painted? I paint China. And, and what, and what well, in here did you do? Well, this cabinet is full of it. Up here? That cabinet is full of it. And the everything except one or two uh, antiques in these shelves. Uh, That's obviously where you learned it from. Yeah. How about oh, these beautiful. cups with the birds? I painted all of them. Incredible, aren't you? That's marvelous. Now, I didn't paint the virgin that's in the window. I did about half of the birds, or more than half, maybe. The flowers on the china, too? Oh, yes, I did all those. It's uh, really realistic. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed doing it. My son was painting at the time that I found the lady who gave lessons and well, that was her husband that came with the army. Mm. And uh, I thought, well, I've always enjoyed China, and I'll do this so I don't uh, interfere with his work. Well, I can tell you. He, <laughs> he had talent that I'd never have. No, I well, wouldn't say that. You've got a lot of talent. <laughs> but obviously, he had lots of talent, too. He yeah. had a lot of talent. But it was pretty much a sideline for him? Mm -hmm. Uh, he was 40 years old when he died, and uh, he had really just gotten into the artistic efforts. He drew from the time he was four or five years old, things that you could, that, well, I'm his mother, things that you might say, this is awfully good. He drew one that I hung on the wall until it turned yellow. And it was a, a cowboy standing by a windmill. And the windmill was much taller than, my, the, the cowboy was much taller than the windmill. So you know who was the most important. Mm -hmm. But both were very good. And he was four when he drew that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have paintings of his all over. I have a grand, uh, a grandson and two grandsons. His daughter's sons. One of them is an art teacher. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to video the uh, paintings. All right. I'd like to. I don't know. I don't know if it will come out. How good it'll be, but I'd certainly like to give it a shot. And you say this is his house, or your house? Yes, that's the ranch house that we built. Is it still there? Yes, as far as I know. My husband had, after we moved in here and I knew what was going on, he had five little strokes. But 
but he had glaucoma, and uh, uh, my son and I were suspicious that he had some. This is a, a painting of his, too. This is not a photograph. Hmm. Is it done from a photograph? But this one, my son did it. Worked in a lot of mediums. Oh, yeah. He had glaucoma and was treated for it for several years, and uh, his eyesight was such that this old excitable woman wouldn't ride with him, <laughs> except on a ranch where it didn't matter. And but we were coming back from Roswell with a load of feed, and I was driving. We had a three-quarter ton pickup, and usually loaded it with. Three times. This is what approximately? This was in maybe in the 50s. I couldn't tell you exactly. It didn't have anything to do with that. Right, right. Uh, and uh, have you been, I guess you've been to Corona. Yes. And have you crossed the Gallo and then gone? Up by what was the Reynolds Ranch then, there's a long straight road right along the, the top of the, I'd call it a mesa. It, it stretches for at least two or three miles, just as straight as a river. You come up from a, a deep draw and go up on this long straight road. Well, go That's back. From Corona. This is going to Corona. Going to Corona. The cutoff, but it's 59 miles out here, and then it cuts off to go to Corona. It wasn't paved then. And uh, anyway, uh, go back to 1942. About 1942, uh, there were lots of, of uh, army planes going over because that's right on a direct line between here and Albuquerque. And there was one that had the bomb site. If you remember, they had a bomb site that they protected with men's lives. And the planes were fixed so that they'd blow up if they didn't land just properly. Well, anyway, this plane circled every this was night. We had gone to bed, and it was about 10, 11 o'clock, and nearly everybody had tin roofs. This was 1942 now. You could see the tin roofs shining in whatever light there was, and uh, uh, this plane, you could tell it was in trouble because of the way the motors sounded, and they, sound, they circled every uh, ranch house in that area hours included. And by the time you think of what to do to go down to the field with your pickup and shine the lights uh, on the furrows the way they ran or something, they were gone and gone on to some other place. Anyway, they spotted this, this long road across there. And they tried to land and it blew up. They cordoned that off for a week, gathering up pieces. And anyway, this was 1950, and I was driving real slow, and up out of the Gallo, which is very sandy, you don't cross the Gallo just anywhere. Uh, it's so sandy that you could bog down in the sand came this red light, just as round as the moon, a large red pulsating light, came up out of the gallo 
came directly at us, and all I could think of, we were up on this long road, all I could think of was uh, that it was a plane with that was in trouble when trying to land. And uh, I I know that Lyman agreed. I must we must have talked something. The the bar ditch was awfully deep, and we went off on that side. It's a wonder the thing didn't turn over with the load we had. But anyway, he got out and run down the hill, and I had a heck of a time getting my door open. But I did get out, and I saw it not through the windshield. And this light came right straight over us and stood there, just as still. And all at one time, it took off and went on in another direction. Now, it didn't occur to me at the time until the next day, there was not a sound. No sound. You were outside the pickup at that point. I was outside the pickup. I was not seeing it through glass. And there was not any sound. And I said to Lyman, I'm going to call. We had a telephone to land, too. And must have had part of this house built. And uh, I said, I'm going to call White Sands and tell them they lost one of their rockets. He says, you just shut up and don't say one word. They'll make a fool out of you. And they already had two or three people who had seen things. And uh, I was just convinced it was some earthly thing that had gotten loose. But I would like to ask you all, is there any theory of anybody has had a theory that this is a light thing? I mean, like we send a searchlight. The searchlight doesn't make any sound. You throw a baseball through the air and it makes a sound. And I can't help but think that if it appeared to me that this thing was uh, not over 100 feet above, maybe not that much, I couldn't really tell. It was pitch dark. It was something I'd never seen before. And uh, has anybody ever How's seen How's the weather like? Clear. clear. Yeah. I remember there was no muddy road, no nothing like that. I've heard hundreds and hundreds of reports like that. And you've heard that they don't make a sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. Has anybody said that it could be a uh, uh, something that's beamed from somewhere else? Your guess is as good as anybody else's. Speculation, uh, theories about like, holographic projections that almost appeared to be three-dimensional from a projector but and it's you not even a solid object it's just a projection just a ball of light but well this we, was we a pulsating really. red round thing what shade of red i'd say it was a little bit uh yellow red just a little yellow red Lots of red to so it. Orange red. More orange red, yes. If I'm going to my palette, I'd pick up the yellow red. Mm -hmm. But it would be an orange red. Well, we even have lots of reports of huge vehicles hovering over people's heads with no sound at all. Mm -hmm. And they can tell that it's a vehicle. Oh, yes. Yeah. Daytime. And no sound. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you explain that? Because, like I said, you throw a ball through the air and you've got a sound. The theory there is, too, that somehow the object is able to, uh, with some type of uh, a, a, for a field that would surround the object, actually draw the surrounding air molecules with it that would serve to cushion it and eliminate the friction, the air friction. Something. I know it's speaking Greek. But really, <laughs> we, don't, we don't know. 
There's no friction. In other words, there's no, well, you know what a sonic boom is, as yeah. far as you call That's where the air is separated by the supersonic jet, and as it comes together, it claps. So whatever this is, it doesn't cause that. It doesn't allow it to come together. It doesn't seem to have to come together. There seems to be no break in the air. That's where the theory that it's actually drawing air with it. See, too, when you have an object that moves that fast, that the friction would cause it to start to glow. That's where, like, a meteorite breaks up, or even a satellite in re-entry would burn up as it comes into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We don't get that. Well, this thing wasn't a meteorite because it stood there. Uh, maybe they were uh, seeing how smart we were to see if they wanted to ask us a few questions. I don't know. We decided they didn't. How long did it sit there? You know, you're under such a stress at the time, it's hard to say. I would say a few seconds, uh, maybe certainly not more than three to five minutes. But you were moving in the truck at the time. No, so I had, had stopped. stopped the truck. You had stopped? Yes. And was it up ahead of the truck as it appeared to hover, or was it, it overhead? It hovered right overhead. Right overhead. Mm -hmm. If I had been in the truck, I couldn't have seen it. But I had, uh, you so know, it's you hard to open a pickup truck. Looked out to the windshield. I didn't look out through the windshield. Um, I did when I first saw it. Right. My husband had run off down the draw, and he kept hollering at me to come on out his side. And I really, I think I was afraid that the whole pickup would turn over because that was a deep barbage. I've heard that they've got that road paved now, and I don't know what kind of barbage is they got. But that one was deep. And uh, anyway, I remember struggling out on the driver's side and uh, stood there because by that time, by the time I got out, I could see that it was not an airplane that was trying to land and come down the road. But that's what I thought it was. Could this have been in 1949? It could have been. Uh, I couldn't swear to the date. I hauled an awful lot of feed by myself. Uh, his eyes got so bad that... Well, when did his eyes get bad? Uh, I guess he had some eye problems from the time I first knew him. Uh, but uh, they were not treated right. until uh, in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. And by that time it was really too late. He, he was blind for four or five years before he died. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he died quite a few years ago, right? Six years ago. Well, six years ago. Seven years ago mm -hmm. in January. He and Clint Sofermeyer saw some things. I don't know if they were told one either or not. And I know I saw one that looked like a campsite about 11 o'clock at night one night. I went, this was a crooked road that went from Sofermeyer's to our place. And uh, we had had a lot of sheep stealing. I've got a snapshot over there of where Treats put out a, a trap. You know, a sign that said there would be a, a that they would pay a, they would pay for information on the sheep. Rewards sheep. for it. Uh, yes, a reward. And uh, I went right home and called Clint and of course got him out of bed. Told him that this campsite was up above, there had been an old road there. And Clanny says, why, that road washed out to where nobody could get in there. And they went up there the next morning and come around from the top side, and they said they found a dead, uh, well, I believe it was a cat. A cat that had been dead. Was it 
there evidence of a cash plan? You know, I don't remember. But I do remember what looked to me as I passed it like a, a light, a lantern lights that would show through a tent, through some of the openings in the tent. Anybody moving around? No, I didn't see anybody. See, I was driving and I didn't want to sit there if that was sheep stealers mm -hmm. and wait for them. And I didn't know that the road was going down. Plenty's pasture. Then in our pasture, there was a, a, a bluff on the, we called it the Bonita. And to me, it would be 100 feet down. Maybe it's not more than 50. But they had it fenced off so the livestock couldn't come up there and graze and fall off. And it was very rough. You couldn't get up there with a pickup or a, even a jeep because uh, pieces would fall out and fall into the, the canyon below and that was above our house and as we turned the corner to come in into a ball game one night and come in after the ball game and here was a light going down like from one fence post to the other just as clear I don't drink <laughs> and I didn't say it. Uh, this ball game, uh, you remember anything about the weather? No, I wouldn't have gone if the weather had been very threatening. Not that I... We lived in a, a remote enough area and had livestock that... Uh, oh, I guess I... Uh, an old stick in the mud, I just wouldn't have gone. I'm not that crazy about sports. My kids were, uh, the boys were playing. One of them. The other one went to private school. You've had an interesting time. You know, I think so too. And we saw the first atomic bomb. Oh yeah? Yeah. You saw the flash? Yes. And this is true. Uh, my husband was one of those that uh, thought if you didn't want to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you were probably a little lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and he shook me in around and he says, come here and look. And we just, this was an old house and just had one, one little window about the size of that out on the west side. And, and uh, he wanted me to see this explosion, and I didn't see, did not see any mushrooms. We were in a direct line from Almogorda, uh, behind the mountains. Mm -hmm. But, and, I, and it was very white, and it went right straight up. If there was a mushroom, I didn't see it. I got up and looked and went right back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think it was? Uh, we talked about it a minute or two and thought it, I think he suggested it might be an ammunition zone because nobody knew what was going on over there then. Right, right. It hadn't been announced. Absolutely. And uh, that's what we decided it was and I thought, well, it's, it's an ammunition dump, so what do you got me up here for? <laughs> so I went back to bed and I think, I think he went in and made coffee. Had you heard any rumors about what was going on? If, if so, I don't remember it. Uh, we had uh, we had an awful lot of drought, <clears throat> and we also had uh, planes that we know they came out of Almogorda, out of base there, that scattered something that that dispersed the clouds and. Um, I, out here, I've got a government bulletin and an old uh, I've got it out there in a box. I don't know where it is. It takes a while to go find it. Anyway, uh, the ranchers all really they thought that the uh, that these 
young boys were doing this. They were buzzing windmills too at times. And they thought they were doing some of it just on their own, just to be funny. And uh, they made a protest and there was, I can't remember that man's name for sure. Anyway, the general, and he came in from El Paso. And he told them that it was not his boys that were doing that. It was a group that was uh, assigned to experiment with the weather. And he gave us the address uh, and what to ask for, and we got these bulletins, this one that I'm talking about. And anybody that asked for one after that didn't get it. They shut it off. But I still got it. Tell us about the experiments. The experiments were going all up and down the Rockies, even into Montana. And there was a big experiment station right there at the mouth of the Platte River where they had, when they had that big flood on the Platte. Uh, 19, I But this one was spotted too. I mean, it, it was named. We got the first government bulletins from Montoya, Mr. Montoya. Anderson was, the Senator Anderson was down right in the throat. We were just a bunch of hicks that didn't go anywhere. But they could see some of these planes coming in. They were branding calves or marking lambs or something one time and a bunch of men uh, around on the guido and this wasn't at our ranch but all the neighbors got together to do those things and they could see something being uh, dumped out or spewed out of these planes and the planes going right you might say into the clouds or they appeared to go into them. the clouds of Spanish just go buy more feed. <laughs> <laughs> you saw this happen? I didn't see that. My husband was there. But I saw, uh, I saw the planes come in. One time we were stuck in that same draw that had that bluff on it I was telling you about. With the, uh, anyway, the water had come down. Those magazines are to be given away and you can have any you want. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> we were stuck, and there was the biggest old black cloud up above, and we needed rain and needed it bad. And we were just working like crazy to get that. It was my husband and his oldest son and I to, to get that pickup out of the draw because it would have washed it away. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the planes come in. And finally, somebody noticed them there, and those clouds just absolutely vanished away. Mm. This this uh, government thing, uh, they said in so many words that they were trying to send the moisture into the into the areas that needed it for uh, dry land farming, wheat, and so forth. They said. I think they nearly got sued. They washed away the. Uh, Kansas City Stockyards once, <laughs> which served them right. <laughs> I think that's all we really need. Great. You've done some wonderful work for us. Well, I hope it's been worth something. I think the American people ought to know what's going on. I can realize one reason that this is kept secretive is you remember Orson Welles? You're, yep. you're too young. Well, well we, we read about it in the newspapers. I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, he had written a play. Right. And I think it was in New York City that That's there was right. a downright riot. War of the them. Worlds. Yeah. Uh, people from the other worlds were coming, and the people in New York City just panicked. <laughs> as, as they're well known to do, people I in New York City. I guess so. Anyway, uh, 
That's the only reason I can see why they can't be honest. Of course, now they've had so much practice yeah. at being dishonest. Yes, and they Second nature. they have been uh, uh, used to the idea of their superiority and lording it over the rest of them. Mm -hmm. We're just the taxpayers. We're just children that have to be taken care of. Yeah, we're just a taxpayer that yeah. they can gouge for more money. So what do you believe crash out at the Foster Ranch in 1947? What do I think? Yeah. Well, for several years I really thought that it might be something the, the Russians were experimenting with, but I don't think so anymore. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that perhaps we had the greatest technological advances of anybody in the world. Mm -hmm. and. Um, they haven't found any living people on any other uh, planets that they, they got to come from somewhere. So you believe it was from somewhere else? Yes, unless we find a, a group of people in this world that are smarter than we know about. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's from this world anymore. It would make a difference. Well, I think that'll lure them. Thank you very much for your time. We will I'll make a copy of the tape. I won't promise the quality will be very good. And I, I'd like to buy two. I'll make oh, two copies and send them to you. If you are, don't don't worry about yeah. it's there. It's very simple to do and it doesn't cost anything. It'll be our pleasure. So you get more sort of our, our payment for, yes. you, for you helping us out. Well, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Okay. And your name is? You can speak up. It won't hurt. <laughs> and we're here in Delhart, Texas on October 1st. And you were a niece yes. of Barney Barnett. Of his wife. Mm -hmm. it's, and you, did they, now did I understand that, that they kind of raised you for a while? Or? They uh, were, I was real close to them. They babysat me all about uh, for two or three years. Mm -hmm. to help, and they helped spoil me. And <laughs> They did not have any children of their own. Uh -huh. So, Barney was a civil engineer yes. for the Soil Conservation Service, yes. working in an office in... Socorro, New Mexico. His office was in Socorro? Yes. Okay. And, and he you was employed by the U.S. government, you know, mm -hmm. for... You remember the story that Barney told? Well, I remember that he saw uh, one time we went to visit, and I don't know whether it was before my husband and I married or after, I don't recall the date, but he said that he saw a UFO uh, fall. Mm -hmm. He was out working in the field, and I understood that he it was out in the St. Augustine uh, plain, mm -hmm. and he went over to where it was, and uh, where it fell. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, got nearly to the side, and there was a group of um, people on a ge geological mm -hmm. or a archaeological mm -hmm. uh, hunt, and uh, they were over there. I, I, I don't remember how many people he said, but they got nearly up to this UFO, but it was close enough that you could see some creatures, or he said they didn't look like human beings mm -hmm. out there. And uh, along came a government, or some trucks. No, but it's government, you mean? I guess it was government. You know, as I say, it's been mm -hmm. a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But someone came along, and I understood it. I don't know if it was army or what. I think he mm -hmm. just termed it government trucks, and they told him to go on back and forget they ever saw anything. Now, that's all I recall. Mm -hmm. He wasn't specific on whether it was army or he just said government. I don't recall. Did he have any clue as to where the archaeologists came from? He didn't say. If he did, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. He just said a bunch of young people on a dig. Did he ever describe the creatures to you? I don't recall. He said, did he give you a number? Do you remember if there were? No. And they were all dead? So far as, you know, they weren't moving. 
so he never said that one might have been alive or might have been No, injured. I don't think he got that close to him. You know, I mean, he didn't get right up to the side. Mm -hmm. Seems like there was a fence, and he, they blocked it off. Mm -hmm. Or if they may have had him move back to the fence, I don't know. But you don't know exactly where this was, other than you think it was up in the... Uh, I feel that it was up in the Daddle or Magdalena, what mm -hmm. he termed as the high country. The high country. And he didn't give me any clue as to what side of the plains it would have been on, or whether it was closer to Daddle or Magdalena. No. If he did, I don't think so. And I don't really think he did. <laughs> did he ever describe the object itself to you? Say anything about that? Do you know, I don't, you know what, since you've heard about all these mm -hmm. others and things, mm -hmm. you don't re realize, I don't recall if what he said or what has been put into my mind, or you know, mm -hmm. that I, not, not that anybody's put anything into my <laughs> mind. <laughs> well, but you've, but, you, you've, what you've read and uh, you've read the books, you saw the Unsolved Mysteries program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And things that you've talked about. Mm -hmm. And there's been talks of UFOs ever since. Mm -hmm. But your, your memories then are just pretty vague about what he'd said. Right. Except that I do know that he said he saw a UFO. Mm -hmm. And that there were creatures, creatures in it. And or he saw people or whatever. So and I believe he did say describe it as a round thing. But you know, mm -hmm. let's say I don't know what. Um, do you remember, do you recall now in the subsequent years what his feelings about UFOs were? I don't even recall us talking about it. What is your, what's your feelings about it? What do you think? Yeah, and since he saw one, I know that it's true. So you believe, based on what Barney told you, yes. that flying saucers are real, and they're piloted by beings from other planets? Is that a fair assessment? I don't know who they're, uh, I just know that they're real. Mm -hmm. Or this, yes. But you'd trust anything Barney told you on that Yes, order. I would. Was he ever known to play practical jokes or spin tall tales or anything like that? Oh, I don't know that he'd play practical jokes, but not spin tall tales. Mm -hmm. So he was very... But this, he was serious about mm -hmm. this. This was a serious person. Did it ever come up more than one time that you remember? I don't recall. So, <laughs> and you have really no clue... I'm sorry, no, I, I recall it so far. <laughs> that's fine. That's exactly what we want. Is exactly what you remember, not what Somebody others else. may have said or things that people yeah. might have said, but what you you recall yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so you really have no clue as to when he mentioned this to you, other than it may have been in the fifties. It was in the um, middle or latter forties uh, or early fifties. Early fifties. Real early 50s. I feel like it was before the 50s. So it might have been 49 or 48. So it might have been right after, close to the time it happened. Who knows? Do you remember the context? I'm sure you don't. Remember the context of the conversation, how it came up at all? But it made enough impression upon you that you remembered at least a few of the details. Anything else that you can think of that. Not a thing. Hmm. So you have. I've tried, you know, to rack my brain. To, you know, it seems ridiculous that we didn't discuss it later, and we may have. But mm -hmm. I don't recall. We were all busy, and you know, you mm -hmm. see them maybe a day or two at a time. What, given what you know, what uh, Barney Barnett said to you, what's your feeling of, of uh, the government claims that there's no such thing, no such thing, no validity? Oh, I just don't have too much of an opinion, except you know, the government. You know the government. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think the government's hiding information about UFOs from us? They might. Uh, and this they must be. It's obvious if, if they're the ones who came along and said, be quiet about this. Mm -hmm. But Barney did mention the archaeologist. Yes. Did he mention anybody else who might have been there? No, he just said, these people want to dig, and they told us all the kind you don't have any clues how many people were involved? Nobody else there that... Uh, no, I think he must have been working alone. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, uh, this was sure short. That's right. That's I why sure I sure don't know much. That's why I put it on the end of the date. <laughs> I sure don't know much. <laughs> but you have no doubt that Barney was telling you the truth about this. Did Barney ever have trouble with the government afterwards? Maybe with the Internal Revenue Service or anything like that? Nothing like that that you can remember? No harassment from, from the government? No, no harassment of any kind that I... Mm -hmm. And he retired from the Soil Converse Conservation Commission? Yes, I think in about 1956 because of poor health, uh -huh. I believe. And then he, did he stay in Socorro? He stayed in Socorro mm -hmm. until you know, his death mm -hmm. and then in 1969. So he was retired a lot. And Ruth, what? She moved uh, to, uh, she stayed in Socorro a year or two after he died, mm -hmm. and her health was bad, and so she moved to Dalhart. Mm -hmm. And then she passed away? Passed away here in Dalhart in 1975 or 76. Uh -huh. Probably 76. Did she ever mention this at all? And no. Never, never brought it up? Uh, no, I don't think so. You know, you just went on with what the present. Wasn't really that major of an event in anybody's life then. <laughs> I guess it wasn't, and even though you can't imagine it. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> now that now I can't imagine it. It just played down. So but we were able to discuss it. Okay. Well, I, I even inquired to my friends back then. Do mm -hmm. they, you know, say we might have come home and told somebody, but they don't remember me telling. Of course, they might have as poor memories as I do. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I've probably, as they say, taken up enough of your time. So I'm going to. That's fine. I'll turn off the camera here. Okay. It worked out real well, didn't it? I don't know. It wasn't horrible or anything. It was scary. It was scary. <laughs>